I'm not going to talk, use the word populist, even though that's in the title very much. I don't like that term. It, it denotes too many different things. And just this morning, I was reading in the New York Times uh, a, a good sentence. I do give it a, a footnote, even though I told Mark, or your brilliant uh, interpreter back there, that uh, I will just steal the sentence, but actu actually it was in the New York Times, which compared populists to teenagers uh, who uh, have the power and the talent to disrupt a family, and they often do. We of often did, uh, but we don't have the power and the skill to actually run or govern a family. Disruption. And so I think uh, our populists are doing just that, but I don't think they are acquiring the power in the long run, in the long run, to, uh, uh, to cause uh, too much trouble. I think the negative news is uh, ex somewhat exaggerated, even though precisely the country that I'm about to talk about, which is the United States, my acquired homeland, uh, is experiencing a major disruption, uh, uh, not just by a president who is acting often as a teenager, uh, tells one thing one day or one hour, and the opposite the next hour, uh, and lies all the time, which teenagers often do. Maybe not very serious lies. Some of us did not lie uh, extensively, but there are white lies. Well, this president lies all the time, and he is uh, immature. But I don't believe the United States uh, will, uh, in the longer run, uh, follow his lead. But I don't want to get ahead of my story, so let me just uh, start out, curiously enough, by talking about the United States. Uh, I, I want to tell you a very old Soviet joke, uh, which comes from the 1970s, uh, I think. And if some of you heard, heard it before, then please forgive me. I probably will ruin the joke as I try to tell it, but it, it has a uh, Russian man, let's call him Ivan Ivanovich, who uh, by then somehow acquired some money and uh, uh, he wanted to buy a car. This is a fantasy, I hope you realize that. So he goes to the uh, store where they sell cars and uh, let's say Volkswagens. And so he says, I'd like to buy a little uh, Volkswagen. And the salesman says, well, what kind would you like to have, Ivan Ivanovich? So he describes in some detail what he would like. He would like an automatic transmission, a good FM radio, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, the salesman writes it down, and no problem at all. And so he uh, uh, the, they settled the business. And so he asked, well, how much will this cost? Now, I have to give this figure to you in, uh, in dollars. Uh, it makes more sense uh, because the uh, value of rubles has changed you know, so much over the years. So uh, the salesman says it will cost $130,000. Well, $130,000. Ivan Ivanovich reaches into his inner pocket and pays the salesman. And uh, $130,000, that's an awful lot of money. And uh, so then he says, well, could you tell me, comrade, when can I pick up the car? And so uh, the salesman looks at his schedule, and he says, uh, let's see, this was in 1978. He says, would it be all right on March 13th, 1995? March 13, that's a long, long wait, but the man says, well, sure, uh, that's quite all right, and he leaves. And then something occurs to him as he gets to the corner, and he goes back, he says, excuse me, comrade salesman, should I come in the morning or in the afternoon? And uh, this was one ending to this joke. There's another ending, and the other ending says um, uh, that he goes back to the salesman, and uh, says, uh, 
uh, or would you make sure that it's in the afternoon? And the salesman says, why? Because I have an appointment with a plumber in the morning. <laughs> I tell this story uh, with a purpose because when you talk about the United States and the enormous, if I think only short-term changes underway there, they have little to do with economics. They have little to do with the shortages that, uh, that uh, the Soviet Union is most famous for. Uh, your parents and grandparents certainly could tell you stories about the long lines. I remember going to the Soviet Union and seeing strong lines for food and other items as well. Shortages is the important key to the Russian economy, in my judgment. In the United States, we don't have shortages. It's a, uh, even generally speaking, money is not the key issue here. Uh, uh, maybe to the extent that the distribution of money in the uh, U.S. economy is eminently unfair, excessively favoring the very, very rich. But the issue is still not money. That's not what brought uh, Trump to power. What brought, brought him uh, to power is a crisis of identity. Uh, uh, more than anything else. It has to do with uh, the Americans' self-image on the one hand, uh, with the illusion of exceptionalism that uh, many Americans uh, had come to believe uh, that uh, the United States was a very special world uh, that uh, God has created for Americans. And I'll talk, talk about this in just a moment. Uh, the other uh, crisis, identity crisis, has to do with the international role of the United States, with geopolitics, uh, the belief in the, in, the, in, in the need for the US to take care of all problems since the United Nations Security Council is hopelessly uh, deadlocked. Uh, this is, I believe, these two things are the essential background to the election of Trump, even though I'd like to emphasize that which you know, which is that three million of us, uh, three million uh, voters, three million more voters voted for Mrs. Clinton than for uh, Mr. Trump. Uh, and yet right now we have the prospect of uh, reversing uh, 70 years of history in the international realm, and almost that, about 50 or 60 years in, uh, in the domestic realm. Let me talk about the domestic situation first. Uh, I think few people appreciate the extraordinary, even the, uh, uh, revolutionary, radical changes that have taken place in the United States since the 1960s. Uh, I was already uh, a res very much a resident, I was already a professor in the 1960s, and uh, I felt it uh, very deeply, and this is, uh, I will give you a summary of that. Only after World War II did the United States begin to integrate itself, uh, giving blacks, uh, a place in American uh, society. Uh, and that was done by President Truman when he integrated the armed forces of the United States. And af af after, even after that, segregation remained a key aspect of American, American life. Not so much by law, although in the southern states, the states, not the federal government, the states did enact many segregational uh, laws simply because the whites ruled and they believed that uh, blacks should be in the back of the bus uh, and, and go to different schools and so on. I saw a little bit of that, I think a couple of years ago at one of our meetings uh, here. I related this personal story from 1958 when uh, I, on the, during the spring vacation, of, I was a student 
and I was in the, uh, in the heartland of the country, in Indiana, state of Indiana, where I was a student. Uh, some of my new friends said, would you like to go to Florida during the vacation? I said, hey, are you kidding? Of course I would like to go, especially when they said that's where the girls are. In fact, there was a movie. There was a movie uh, made, excuse me, about these <clears throat> parties at the time. And so, in any case, that's neither here nor there. Uh, uh, we went uh, in a big car, I think seven of us uh, in a big American car, and we made one stop at a motel in the state of Georgia, not to be confused with uh, Tbilisi, but this is the state of Georgia in the United States, in the southern part. And in the motel, there was a neon light, that I, and a neon message that I will never ever <coughs> forget. It said, it says, it said, excuse me for the uh, uh, now no, uh, wrong expression, but that this is what it says. No niggers, no Jews, no dogs. This was still 1958 in the United States of America. Now there were other trends as well, and they took off particularly after the death of John F. Kennedy. Uh, uh, his promise was uh, realized by his successor, Lyndon Johnson, whom I consider after Lincoln uh, uh, the most important president of the United States, despite Vietnam, for which he is in large part responsible. And that was a tragedy. But domestically, <coughs> he uh, revolutionized basically the United States. And he could do it because he used to be a Southern segregationist. Uh, one of the par curious paradoxes of political life that the man who integrated America or who began on a large scale to integrate America used to be a segregationist. And uh, that, that's when American society, which I experienced, began to change significantly. Uh, women, not just, not just uh, uh, the right to vote, but the right to be equal, because salaries still, have, still to this day have not kept up with men's salaries, but the role of women in American society has changed. Housing, education, uh, and of course for blacks, uh, extraordinary changes. And I'll just mention one thing here. Uh, it was called affirmative action. Uh, that was enacted in the late 1960s by the federal government and, and not imposed but encouraged uh, uh, schools uh, and employers to apply it. What did it mean? It meant that if you had, this was uh, in theory, if you had two applicants and one was a white man and the other one was, let's say, a black man or a, a white or black woman, then you should, should affirm uh, and, uh, uh, the right uh, of uh, women or blacks or other minorities to get that job. Now, on paper, this was fully justified after a century of, this, uh, of segregation and so on. And yet, uh, and yet uh, uh, today we understand, I understand, that uh, it was a source of problems because every time you, you, you advanced a black man, and that was a great thing, uh, uh, that white man who didn't get the job and who was possibly equally good, maybe in some case, cases better, obviously uh, felt that he was discriminated against. In other words, uh, a discriminating movement produced discrimination as well. Many other things uh, uh, happened at that time uh, that was led by elites. Yes, the, uh, the liberal elites especially, but also conservative elites. Uh, Nixon would have had a chance to reverse these trends. He did not. President Reagan would have had a chance during eight years to reverse these trends, and he did not. Uh, in other words, Amer the American elites uh, pursued this path towards equality and doing justice, doing justice to blacks and to women 
with great determination, even though the publics, as we now understand better than we used to, the publics were not quite on board. Uh, they had some, some issues, some problems uh, with this, and I, I suppose especially white males, which I suppose we either, we in the elite uh, did not notice, professors are part of the elite, I suppose, uh, we did not notice or we did not uh, pay attention to or did not want to pay attention to, who knows. Um, but the, um, uh, this is the essential background to, to Trump's rise. Uh, this is the rebellion of whites who feel that they are, they have been discriminated against. And you know, there, there is something to this. I, 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 I'd like to, come much as I supported integration greatly and continue to support it, but I'll tell you just one little story. I was the chairman of a political science department at a college and we were hiring and uh, a new uh, younger faculty member, uh, I forgot now when it was, maybe in the 80s, and one of the three finalists was a black guy. And uh, we hired him. And you know, we told ourselves that he was as good, good as the others. Looking back now, I think we, uh, we cheated a little bit because the school's, uh, uh, I guess you would call it in Russia, rector, uh, the dean, uh, encouraged us, did not press us. It was our decision. There was a vote in the depart my department. Uh, and, but they, we were encouraged to hire, fi at long last, a black professor. And it happened in many other places with women as well. So uh, uh, this is a very real issue. It's not good versus bad or bad versus good. It is, uh, it is more complicated than that. But in any case, American society uh, pushed ahead very vigorously led by the elites, political, journalistic, uh, academic elites, to press towards a more equal treatment of all people, which of course we all support, but, but we didn't notice, maybe didn't want to notice, that white males were not on board at that time. So what we have now is a popular rebellion that, uh, that Trump took advantage of. With, uh, uh, he has great political skills. He understood uh, that, uh, that uh, the feelings at that time. Uh, he understood that for every young man, uh, uh, every young woman, and every young black man, there is a white, white man who was pushed out of a job uh, that used to belong to him. So we have an un, uh, uh, upheaval, which I believe, I, I don't want to go into more details, I don't have that much time, but I do want to mention that uh, what has made it possible to a great extent is the internet. The internet is a blessing. I could read the New York Times here uh, on, my, on my phone or computer. Uh, that's really extraordinary. Uh, but it's also a curse because of the, the excessive freedom that it, it, uh, it provides. Particularly, I object to, uh, well, I object to the language. I object to the language of the internet. I object to the language uh, because it is vulgar and disrespectful, especially when it comes to young, it comes to uh, anonymous letters. I don't know how it is in Russia uh, very much. Well, I do know a little bit. Uh, there is no respect for anybody's opinion. And the anti-elite atti attitude, which you know, has, has something uh, to be said for, but uh, that attitude has turned into a, a hatred towards, uh, towards experts. And uh, in other words, if I write an article about something uh, under that, I will, I will see some, somebody who, is, who can't speak English well, can't write English well, and who seems to presume that he knows as much about, uh, I don't know, European politics as I do. I rather find that very difficult in a democratic society 
uh, uh, even though equality is, is a good thing, but uh, the equality of talent and specialization and expertise is not quite good for a democratic society. Now, uh, let me say something about the international part of, of this political uh, revolution that we are experiencing. For some 75 years, the United, since World War II, the United States has played a key role in international affairs. Now, uh, I'm sure that we, we all have different views here about this. My own view is that uh, the, that role by the United States has been largely constructive. I believe that uh, it, uh, the U.S. has not been a colonialist uh, power, but and certainly an imperial power in the sense that it's dominating uh, world affairs. As much uh, after the, the uh, end of the Cold War as before, even now, uh, obviously, the public in the United States does not uh, want to play that role anymore. But the U.S. has not been an imperialist power like France or Great Britain or Holland uh, or Portugal or many others over the centuries in that uh, it did not fight or did not get into this area or that for, for material advantage. And aside from Japan and Germany, uh, the U.S. also got out uh, uh, as soon as, as, as it could. Um, so as I said, it's not an unselfish role that the United States played but uh, uh, and made extraordinary critical uh, mistakes and committed huge crimes in Iraq and before that in Vietnam and probably some other places, uh, and also adopted some of the terrorists' worst methods in uh, interrogations, for example, that is the shame of America. But uh, uh, since... Uh, uh, you have to keep in mind uh, the broader picture. And that is that in Europe, for example, aside from the Balkan War of, of the mid-1990s, there was no war, no major war, for over 70 years. Now, you probably all know enough uh, European history to know that that had never happened before. Uh, and an integra integrated Europe was a responsible Europe, and that was due in large part to United States actions. That was planned during World War II uh, in the State Department and elsewhere, what the United States would have to do, not only to win the war, but to win the peace. And that speaks very well for the United States, and I think also during the Cold War, balancing uh, both, uh, both the Soviet Union and China uh, contributed to our survival, which of course most of us take for granted, but in the nuclear age we probably should not. In any case, uh, uh, I would add here that what uh, the situation was made worse, however, the reason why the U.S. is uh, not generally admired or liked in the world is because American hypocrisy, uh, which is to say the, uh, the gap between America's words and deeds is huge. America uh, has a self-image that is, uh, is, is very different from the realities uh, that America produced in the world and produces uh, uh, to this day simply because Americans uh, partly uh, uh, because of the very religious culture uh, and the perfectionism that characterizes American political culture, constantly tell themselves that they are better than they actually are. So uh, be that as it may, uh, Trump has captured the essence of, of resistance to the elites, the hypocritical American political and academic elites uh, and, uh, and decided that he, he would say that uh, we should do in the world only 
what's good for America. In other words, what's in the narrow sense of the word is the national interest. And that, this, this had great res resonance, as it turns out, in the public. It showed the huge gap between what the elites in America believed for a long time and what the pub public has reached. In other words, the public has asked the question, why do we do what we do if we are not, with that costs so much money, uh, which it does, uh, takes up a large part of the American budget, when the results are not very good. The world is okay, but let others do it. It's, it's an understandable reaction to the world, especially by those who are, who are not educated about politics and international relations. So uh, this, this is what's behind it, an America that is reluctant to continue the role that it has played in the world and uh, Trump some days uh, agrees with that. Some days he doesn't. It's very curious. The guy changes his mind every hour, every day, and his popularity is still huge. Don't underestimate a demagogue uh, uh, like that. Uh, a recent uh, poll that I saw, I think from day before yesterday, uh, showed that 96% of those who voted for him would vote for him again, uh, which to my mind, since I don't like the guy at all, uh, is, is striking because what, what do, uh, this 96% of the people, which Trump do they like? Uh, the one this week or last week? Uh, I, I won't give you the, the examples uh, right now because uh, no doubt you have read this in, in the paper. He changes his mind all the time. Uh, one day NATO is obsolete, the next day it's the essence of US foreign policy. Uh, one day he, says, he, 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 uh, uh, he praises uh, uh, a statesman, the next, next day I don't want to deal with him. He called uh, uh, Erdogan uh, in Turkey uh, after, after this uh, plebiscite. Um, this referendum was passed, uh, and uh, it's, uh, Turkey today is a, is a, is a very bad uh, dictatorship. Now, uh, what the consequences of his policies will be, I don't know. But I do see a vacuum here, a vacuum that, that uh, a after the U.S. withdraws from some commitments, as I think it will, uh, uh, who is going to fill the space? Will it be anarchy or will it be China or Russia? I don't think so. Uh, uh, certainly not the European Union, which is on, uh, uh, facing huge problems. Uh, he has managed to uproot the traditions of the last 70 some years and uh, with NATO, with uh, uh, very key trade agreements with, uh, uh, well, with the uncertainty about sanctions towards Russia, for example, which uh, uh, during the campaign he, he, he said he would end, but he hasn't. He might. Y you never know. Uh, I can't be surprised anymore by whatever he, uh, he says. In short, what we have now is a good deal of uncertainty. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, we just don't know what the future will bring, but what we do know is that he has to be taken seriously because he represents a, a, a new way of thinking about the world and about America uh, that m many people support. Maybe, maybe the majority the next time will not. I certainly hope that's the case, but, uh, but you have to beat somebody with somebody. And uh, at this time, the Democratic par Party is leaderless. So my conclusion, uh, because I'd love to get your questions, so I don't want to talk too long. My conclusion, conclusion is that uh, Mr. Trump and populists elsewhere uh, are not a short-term phenomenon. Uh, don't uh, underestimate him. Don't look just at his, what he says. Uh, the empty content, the ridiculous uh, uh, tweets, 
uh, uh, with which he spends his time, or watching cable television and commenting on an anchor's presentation. I mean, it, it, it is unheard of. But he has to be taken seriously, because he and his likes elsewhere uh, understand the, st the strength of nationalist rhetoric more than anything else. Uh, a consequence, serious consequence of his presence in the White House for a long time, if he, if he is, especially if he is reelected, um, will be a retrenchment for women, for blacks, for gays, uh, because that's, uh, they don't vote for him. So therefore, they will be disregarded as much as possible. Internationally, as I implied a minute or two ago, we, we are facing the prospect of a vacuum. I, um, I don't know how uh, whoever is back there, Natalia or Mark, is, uh, translates this. They are brilliant. They, they, uh, they probably uh, know it already before I say it, which is that uh, there is a saying in America, when the cat's away, the mice will play. I hope it, uh, it has its Russian equ equivalent. But uh, uh, this is the real danger in the world. America's withdrawal is, is a, in my judgment, is a, it opens the way for irresponsible leaders and irresponsible countries to, uh, uh, to make trouble. It's unclear now what kind of deterrence the United States or NATO can offer in the world because uh, the president wants to spend a lot of money uh, on U.S. Uh, on the U.S. military. On the other hand, he claims some days that NATO is uh, is uh, is obsolete. The world is is used to a more or less steady uh, combination of fear and respect from the United States, and I believe that there is no respect now, and there is less fear as well, and. The, that's a very bad combination. The important thing is not to like the United States, but the, from the point of view of world peace, which after all is the most important thing there is, no war, no war, no war, that's, that's what really matters. From that point, point of view, it is essential for the, all the bad guys in the world to uh, respect the power and fear the response of and by the United States. So uh, 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 given the uncertainty of US response, uh, what I fear most in the world is miscalculation. That some people will think, and some countries will think, that they can get away with a bad, uh, uh, bad policies. I have in mind countries like North Korea and Syria and Iran, and there are others as well. The, what we, for sure, the so-called liberal international order that was born, born right after World War II. Uh, I, I can't here describe the details of this order. It's, it's important components. It's, it's, it's under challenge, but we don't yet know what the next order will be. So we are in a transition. And all I can say, uh, like all transitions, this is a rather dangerous uh, times, and we have to be quite vigilant and keep hope alive, as I started with. Thank you very much.